Hello and welcome back to Starting Over. It's been a while since I've been here interviewing a guest, but here we are and the very special one today is... Amelia. I am the one and only sister. Exactly. My only sister, my younger sister, Amelia Thompson, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Do you want to introduce yourself to the people? Yes, so I'm Amelia. I'm 22 years old. I'm almost 23 now. And I live in England, but I've come for a little visit to Barcelona to see Tally. Um, actually missed my flight here, but it's okay. Went to a different airport and I'm here now. Um, I'm working as an engineer. Um, that's what I studied at uni. So that's my career. We've got a little celebratory drink. Cheers to that. Cheers to starting over being back for a second series. Cheers. Third day. Hair of the dog. Yeah, I did drink copious amounts on Friday night in Nottingham. May have been part of the reason I missed my flight, possibly. Definitely was. Um, then we went to see Bad Gal yesterday. That was so good. It was so good. We had a few litres of beer because it was the best value. And yeah, now... 10 euros for like a litre glass of beer and now we're at Warren to the Moe. No we're refined girlies. Tell the people more about what you do. You said you're an engineer, but... What does that actually entail? Okay, so by trade, as they would say, I'm a mechanical engineer, so that's what I studied at uni. Whenever I say that, people ask me, do you fix cars, do you do that kind of thing? The answer is no. I wouldn't mind doing that, but that is not what I'm doing. Um, So I'm currently working as a power systems engineer, which basically means I'm working on keeping the electricity grid stable, investing in new projects we need for the grid, um, all the kind of things that come with making Britain go towards net zero. So what, we, does, what does net zero mean? Okay, so net zero, it's all part of trying to mitigate climate change. So Eek. we will try to, well, we will not be emitting any more carbon emissions than we take in because you can capture carbon. Um, you can also emit carbon, so it's balancing those out. Ideally, we'd want to um, be capturing more than we're emitting because we're in a bit of an issue at the moment with climate change. Um, but just, just a little bit. Yeah. Little so bit. we work on quite a lot of renewable technologies, so wind farms. So I've been involved a lot in offshore wind, so putting all the little wind turbines in the sea. Uh, there's solar, there's wave, there's hydro. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of projects and there's, we need a lot of money for it. So that's what I'm working on. Well, you've got some exciting news coming up now. You've got a big move. Sort of the main purpose of this podcast is I usually, well, it's called Starting Over. I usually talk to people who have either like moved abroad or, you know, doing something new. Sort of the idea is it's never too late to start again. Now, I know you're kind of just starting your career, but do you want to tell people a little bit about the exciting move you've got ahead? Yeah, so I currently live in like near Warwick, which is basically slap bang in the middle of England. So that's where my job is. And I've managed to get a job in London, so making a move down to London. I've never lived there. I've only visited like not even that often, a couple of times a year. So Woo, off to the big city. Yeah. Cheers to that, city girls. I'm excited. I'm kind of scared. The bank is going to be broken, but it is what it is, you know got gonna live my best life yeah because for reference like where we're from in the north like how much is a pint of beer three pounds fifty but in london you're looking at five and above right worse so i am a bit of a beer drinker so i know my stuff but yeah you could be inching towards seven pounds for a pint of beer actually terrible and here do, so does the alcohol here in spain feel cheap the fact we got a liter of beer last night for 10 euros yeah and you go like, to you go to the supermarket here and it's like 50 cents for a can of beer yeah or you get like a whole big bottle of spirits and it's like seven euros and like normally in england that'd be like 19 pounds yeah. we pay a lot of tax on alcohol in the uk it's kind of in an attempt that british people drink less but it doesn't work it has not worked we just uh, i don't think we like to be controlled I think we've just got nothing better to do in that cold climate except drink ourselves silly. Mm-hmm. I mean, here we are confirming the stereotype on day three of the bender. But yeah. <laughs> Never mind. We <laughs> do what we've got to. Well, since we're here in Spain, and I bet most of the people watching this are actually going to be Spanish speakers, we all want to hear your Spanish, Amelia. 
She says she can't speak Spanish. She refuses to speak Spanish. But she always reminds me that in GCSE, which for us is like the mandatory exams you have to do at school at 16, she got 2% better than me. So I got 97% and you got like 99 or something like that. I got 98%. Okay, she beat me by like 1 or 2%. I and beat I beat some of the natives. Like I mean, so did I. Like, but I think it's because we like really studied and nerded out about it. Yeah. Because okay, like here we are. Like, yo hablo español sin problema, como todos ustedes saben. But you don't. Like, what's happened That's there? That's scary. I don't know. I think I just didn't go and like live in the countries like you have you've done, mm. and it wasn't my top priority. Whereas I feel yeah. like you were like, I'm going to be able to speak Spanish by this time, and you went and did it. You did it with. French yeah. as well that was honestly like my only like real kind of like driver and like mission that I had clear at 18 years old was I want to be bilingual it was always like my mm. goal in life and everything else kind of came second so here we are but yeah. whereas like some of my goals it'd be like I'm going to win that cross country and then I'll go and do it <sighs> you know so competitive as a child like oh my god she used to play tennis competitively <laughs> at like age like from like, age five right onwards yeah yeah so she's like there about like age nine and she's playing tennis competitively in these tournaments against these like nine-year-old boys and when she beat them or won a point she'd do a fucking victory dance do you remember what it was like your victory dance i think it was something like it was something like this (laughs) it was so funny (laughs) she was so competitive but I like how you've dodged the bullet. We're still waiting to hear your Spanish. Oh, no. Come on, introduce... I thought we'd forgotten. Introduce yourself in Spanish. You can do this. Come on. Me Emilia. Me Emilia. Hola a todos. Good start. <laughs> Me amo Emilia. Y tengo 22 años. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> me encanta jugar al tenis. <laughs> ¿Qué tiene en su estuche? Un boli, una regla, <laughs> una silla, una mesa. So <laughs> 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 ¿Cómo se llama tu mamá? Chara. ¿Cuántos años tiene tu mamá? Uff, blime. <laughs> Actually, don't know. Qui- no. Quince? No, that's not right. <laughs> Con <laughs> 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 oh, uh, Right, come on, let's try and have a conversation. Right. Usted se llama Emilia. Sí. Yo me llamo Tali. Yo vivo en Barcelona, en España. Pero vivía en Chile y mi novio venezolano. Y por eso hablo español. ¿Me entiendes? Sí. ¿Usted de dónde es? ¿Qué país? Inglaterra. ¿Qué te gusta de Inglaterra? Me. Uh, Inglaterra es muy frío. Y no me gusta. We'll leave it there. Uh, y no tengo un novio. We're sweating now from the stress. <laughs> Well, I actually think the reason, okay, yeah, I went abroad and really like nailed the language speaking, but obviously like we did have really good teachers at school. Mm. Yeah. Shout out to Miss Serrano. Yeah. Well, Miss Serrano. I actually can pronounce Senorita. Senorita Serrano. Serrano. She was fucking bomb. Like she was such a good teacher. And also Mrs. Garcia. She was very like tough on me, but she just wanted me to do well. Mm. And here I am. So shout out she once made me sit in the seat where there's a printer on the desk and I had to like I couldn't fit my book on the desk so I was like I had my book on the wall and I was like writing because I I don't know I was late or something the, was there that was, the punishment there was, the one, there was this one seat everyone was like I'm not sitting in the printer seat and I've, I've rocked up late I think I had a tennis lesson or something and it was like Emilia printer I was like oh, God. do you not remember what printer is in Spanish printadora <laughs> I think it's impresora, but I'm actually not sure. Well, there we go. It's becoming obsolete technology. Yeah. I always get that wrong. I think I, I say, like, printed. I say... I say imprimida or imprimida. Rommel's always like, no, impresa. 
And I'm like, it's one of those words that I never get right. Also, like, map is mapa. Mm-hmm. What, what, fe- like, do you think that's feminine or masculine? Well, it seems like a trick question. Yeah, it's masculine. And I'm like, el, el mapa, el mapa. El mapa. Yeah. It's so, like el problema. Exactly. So, yeah, even because I still have these thoughts, like, is it, is it a boy, is it a girl word? Problems mostly come from men. And men are good at reading maps. That's why problema and mapa are masculine. That's my thinking. I think you're correct there. Well, anyway, yeah, that school, people always ask me actually about my school because they're like, I don't know if it ever comes up in conversation. I'm like, oh yeah, boarding school. And I was like, what? When you went mm. to uni, was everyone like, what? I try not to kind of let it out. It's more in the work environment now that I don't really want to say I've been to boarding school. Why? I don't know, I just think it's not got a very good rep. And then if you give the name of the school, and a simple Google search tells you all you need to know, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, we're not going to name drop the school, but fuck me. Let's just say when you Google search that school, the Google ads that come up are a certain type of lawyer. Um, Yeah, honestly. So that school had like monks, and I never had any issue with the monks, but it was a very religious school. But there were like historical issues and then there was also like a case that happened like with a teacher Mm. when we were at the school we were taught by him you were taught one-to-one by him weren't you yeah he was one of my teachers and before i started at the school i had a few like extra lessons um just so i could hit the ground running you know so that would involve actually like going to that teacher's house one-to-one yeah that teacher went to jail didn't he yeah Scary, scary times out scary there, honestly. Scary times. But I think, <laughs> I said to someone that the other day, I was saying like, oh, um, I can't remember how this came up. I was just saying like, it's funny like how girls are so much more comfortable with other girls than boys are with other boys. And like, what do you mean? I was like, well, you know, me and my friends, like we used to have like a bath together at school and like eat popcorn and watch TV. And they were mm. like, why would you be having a bath at school? And I was like, oh. I put oh, that one out. And they were like, the oh, you went to boarding school, you kept that one quiet, didn't you? I was like, yeah, I did till now. Why do you think it's like seen as such a negative thing in the UK? Like, aside from all like the unfortunate news articles about these type of schools, like, mm. I think there is some kind of like negative connotation. And people always ask me, like, did you like it? Was it amazing? Was it like Harry Potter? Oh, because side note, the boarding school we went to was actually like JK Rowling drew her inspiration for Harry Potter because a cousin went there or something. Yeah, and also she based the Dementors off what our monks look like when they go on a morning walk in the fog. Oh, yeah. Cause and they that's kind of like where the Patronus comes in as well. Long they'd have black long robes. Yeah, and they yeah. had like hats. And so the long robes in the fog made her think of the mentors. And then sometimes they had these hats and that made her think of Death Eaters. So. Oh, yeah. They all, all the bad guys, you know, came from our school. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know what to say about boarding school, honestly, because we, you were there for five years, right? And I was there mm. for three years. And I think at the beginning it was fun, but then when all this sort of stuff started coming out in the news, like obviously they were like really cracking down, like trying to save the school's reputation. Mm. But it wasn't just the teachers, like it was just the culture of the school. Like some of the stuff that went on was just absolutely wild, like Lord of the Flies shit. Mm. Like some of the boys, like girls as well, but like some of the boys and terms of like the way they would treat other girls was just so out of order like so at the time bad. you're just like it's the boys being the boys but now i'm out of it now i'm like, I'm like actually oh my gosh. that's a criminal offense it was a breeding ground for criminals <laughs> like, they were literally like criminals. They're boys they're they're criminals honestly like some of the stuff um oh god when you get into sixth form which is you know the last two years like 16 to 18, 16 to 18, years 18 yeah um, we had this social area called the woods. It was quite literally a bit of space in, in the woods and there were chairs and stuff. It was quite nice. People would go there to smoke, which obviously like, wasn't allowed. They um, were really strict on that really as well. They caught smoking. you smoking and you'd get chucked out of school for three days. Yeah, so quite mm. a lot of like Spanish and French people like would smoke. But for them, it was like, why is this being bad? Why is so, this so deep? They were so confused. Like One of them was lighting up like a cigarette one time when we were walking in plain sight in school. And I was like, oh my God, what are you doing? Like yeah. You're going to get in so much trouble. And she was like, what should we eat? I was like, oh dear. Anyway, mm. so this woods place would have a king of the woods, right? <laughs> He's some top lad who's like basically top socialite for the year. 
but they'd have to do trials before they could take that high position. I can't remember how many boys would like go for it, but I remember one year, it was about six boys in my year, and we all just go down to watch. I thought, you know what, I've got nothing better to do. Like, I don't want to endorse it, but you know, I may as well watch. Nothing better to do, you know, big exams coming up, but no, like. But yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. So we're watching, first challenge was something like, down, like eating like five bananas or something really, really quick. So obviously like you feel quite sick and then downing a few beers and I think some milk. Oh, side note, obviously, like, we weren't allowed to, like, just drink alcohol, like, no. in a boarding school underage. Like, that was a whole other, whole other thing we'll get on to in a minute. Whole kettle of fish, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, this starts happening. Boys starting throwing up everywhere, like, buffing all over the grass and stuff. Then they have to, like, strip off and do, like, a massive lap of one of the fields. So they're all just running around naked. And this school was, like, in a massive valley. It was, like, bare countryside. There were no cities near. So, like... It was like this big open valley, so you could see Juice. across the whole school. Yeah, basically. And I think like we had some sort of school Ofsted visit or something. Off the back of... ISI or something like yeah, that. Yeah, off the back of all these unfortunate reports that were coming out about the school. Yeah. So this, this was serious times for this school. Like, they needed a, a good inspection. They wanted to make sure that like other students weren't bullying or hazing each other. And then I'm pretty sure they come walking down the road and they just saw this scene of people jeering and cheering and boys running around naked, sick, beers. And it was just, it was honestly like absolute scenes. It was like chaos. the apocalypse. Absolute and chaos. I think we may have failed that inspection. Yeah, when um, you have like, like 17 year olds like running naked down a valley. like I just scarpered at that point. It's every man and woman for themselves. So you just run and hope you don't get caught. Even though like, you know, I haven't, necessarily done anything wrong but I just you just didn't, didn't want to didn't get want caught the there. there was very much like in that school it was very much like shoot first ask questions later if you were in the wrong place at the wrong so time let it. even if you hadn't done anything like you'd get thrown into that as well mm. into that punishment so yeah we used to they were called bus weren't they when people would be smoking like on that hill and if someone saw like a teacher coming they'd yell like bust and like literally like 50 kids would like just scarper, scarper spread out and like we had this teacher used to come after us like with a dog yes <laughs> actually run with this like this ravenous hound. dog this, yeah this, this wolf yeah <laughs> it was a wolf and we like we were in a boarding house so yeah imagine like we were in Gryffindor for girls yeah <laughs> we were we were we were basically Gryffindor like yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> We weren't clever, we weren't cunning, but maybe we were brave because we went. We had to deal with this fucking wolf all the time. <laughs> so this dog lived in the house with us. <laughs> I remember one time someone tried to ride the dog. It was like, For reference, it's it was like, like the this size time. of a fucking Shetland pony. Yeah, get a saddle on that and you're off. <laughs> So we used to come up to the house for like check-in, which was like this roll call thing where they take the register. And the lady that ran the place, she'd like put up her clipboard like on the oh, back the of the dog. The dog's just there. The dog's staring at all of us and she's like tick, tick, tick. But I remember sometimes like when we'd come back to the house, if we were in a big group, someone in the front would be like, oh, the dog's here. And everyone would be like, oh. And like, I don't know why we didn't like this dog so much because... It the terrified dog, me. The dog did nothing wrong, but the dog just was unfortunate in who its owner was. And it was it's like Mr. Filch and Mrs. Norris from Harry Potter, you know. Yeah. The cat yeah. snitches on the students to Filch. This dog was it telling was the same vibe. This dog was telling tales on us to no our, one likes to Mrs. our boss. Norris, do yeah. they? Yeah, the sort of head of the lady that organised this house and looked after after us like um yeah, I swear that dog would, like, go back and tell tales. For real. She just knew stuff. I don't know how she mm. knew everything we were doing. There was something about, like, the events that she could hear through. She had... Um, she knew fucking everything. She had a vent, like, in her office that connected to some of the rooms. So, like, she could literally hear our conversations. And like, I think someone was planning a bit of a sesh one time. And she heard the whole thing. She knew all the details, timings, where the alcohol <laughs> stored, everything. It's either the vents or it was the dog, like. Right? Yeah, either both both stories sound a bit like fucking sus, but either way, she knew she knew mm -hmm. everything. Like it was a madness, unless she had an informant. Well, that could have been the dog. So, a terrifying woman. Yeah, character building. 
I would say character More building. More so for you, I think. <laughs> she took a, a, a disliking to my sister. Yeah. I kind of mostly slipped under the radar. Yeah, I think you did. I did until like the last two years and then mm. I was just like, I li- and I literally never did anything wrong like the last two years. I was such a nerd. Like I wanted such good results. But I was just being like hounded, like quite literally. Quite literally. <laughs> quite literally the but... wolf hound. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so in summary, when people are like, oh, did you like boarding school? Like, was it a big fucking sleepover? I'm like, I liked it. I feel like it was my childhood trauma, that place, honestly. Mm. like, I think we had quite different experiences because like, mm. I got really involved in like the sport, quite involved in the music as well. We need to get onto that, the music. Um, <laughs> God, but thanks. yeah, I really enjoyed playing all the sport, playing with friends. Like the tennis there wasn't that good, so like I didn't, I kind of lost like how good I was at tennis by going there, which is a shame. But you know, I got better at hockey and I did a bit of cross country. But it was more just like the friendships in house, like were good. Um, but it also meant you know, if anything goes wrong, if anything blows up, everyone knows you can't escape it. Mm, there's no, um, there's no going home. Like we used to be there for like six weeks at a time, like no yeah. respite. I found what I actually found the worst of times was probably the when I was. 16, 17 that year because I was pretty heartbroken Mm, and I would just see my ex everywhere, you know, (laughs) same class, you know, like you cannot escape next to him in class. There's no point blocking him if I'm just going to pop round the corner and there's his face. You're going to see him at fucking breakfast. Yeah, and I'll be like stressing like in the queue, like I'm going to see you at breakfast, like oh, you know. So that was my little trauma, I guess. Um, But other than that like i did enjoy it i think my trauma is just like between me and my therapist like this is not the it's a bit too deep this is not the place to discuss it but let's just say like i fucking celebrated the day like i got out after Mm. leaving school i was like i cried i cried of like sheer shock like (laughs) i have freedom i'm 18 years old because i was 18 years old for six months in that school but that didn't mean anything now that i was an adult you still were like under all these rules and it was very frustrating actually and that day when i like walked out i literally was like this is the start you could literally just go down to the shop and start swigging a drink like it's just crazy like you could do what you want but as soon as you step onto that school campus you're a child again yeah you're under all these and also like they they actually like acted as our parents legally so that was quite difficult as well like it almost like took away because our parents weren't there it almost like took away like our parents say and stuff Mm. so they like decided a lot of stuff for us but yeah. Onto the music. Oh my god, the music. <laughs> so we're, you know, quite good singers. Um, yeah. Should we do a little harmony? Okay. Prima donna girl. Yeah. All I ever wanted was the world. <laughs> There you go. That's, the That's a little snippet. A little snippet um, that we whip out at every like when family event when my parents family are drunk. function. <laughs> They're like, girls, please girls, sing, sing for us, please. Sing, and we're like. <clears throat> <laughs> Marina and the Diamonds, here we go. <laughs> yeah, so I played violin for a couple of years. I Well, we started young, but I mm. probably, when did I stop? Like maybe age 15, 16. Um, but we did quite a lot of singing. And at primary school, we were in the choir and then this thing called the chamber choir, which was like a smaller group. And you just did normal stuff, really. It was Yeah, it was nice. But here... We went into this special sort of choir. It's a choir because there was an abbey at our school, yeah? And we were the choir for that abbey. Yeah. So we would <laughs> sing kind of with the monks. Um, we'd sing at church every week. We then had to go to practice like three times a week. Oh, so we were singing wow. like bare religious music. We do like the Christmas religious songs, like all, all that stuff. Literally like, and I swear like I can understand and speak Latin because of that choir. For real. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't sing in English. No, no, no. it was Gloria in excelsis Deo. What was the rest? It was like in Patris. What is it? Um, Donna the, Nobis Parchem. That's the one, something like that. And then what was like the absolute tune? Um that we all used to like scream to like, be fair there was some english there was one that was like um or maybe it was from the christmas one or something about trust in god um we had quite a few in our repertoire yeah. didn't we i think the best one was god is love like um te deum laudal laudalmus yeah that was a tune 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. yeah. So we used to like bosh out these tunes in Latin like three times a week. Yeah. And, and this is like I need to put a picture in the video here of what yeah. we had to wear. Like very big abbey, hundreds of seats. Then you have this massive crucifix, like Jesus hanging is, from the ceiling. Like it's like the like three times. Man is transcending on that cross. Like. Yeah, it was quite an experience. You know, like we are like very Catholic. Yeah. And, and you know, it was a great experience, but at the same time, like it was like living in the past it was like yeah <laughs> they had like the medieval kind of like chandeliers from back in the day so it's like that big like black ring that's on chains like, and then like of candles. lights and yeah. candles it obviously like replaced the candles with electric lights yeah. over the years but like it was massive the whole school was in there like all 700 kids on a sunday morning oh yeah because we didn't get sundays off either no. we, we, were we also went to school on saturday we went to school on saturdays and we were in there on a sunday morning doing yeah. church having mass yeah and we were there in the choir in our so, little we had like these long like tunics and cassocks like we were basically dressed like a priest like yeah so the boys wore a long red tunic with this white cassock, cassock on top called, yeah. which is a bit shorter and then we wore blue um so we were the scola puelar, puelar, puelar. Uh-huh. and the boys were scola cantorum yeah. Right? yeah yeah why is that because like because they're the singers and we're the girls yeah exactly because cantorum is like we sing, sing yeah, to sing, sing right yeah. and then poelam is like is women. women females yeah because it was always like poela s en hortus or mm. some shit when Caecilius, we est in villa exactly canis which est in i also think is what helped me to speak spanish because mm. like really like how different is it like yeah it's just <laughs> latin it's like you can just use your British accent basically and it's fine mm, but yeah. with the other countries like you actually need to put a bit of effort into the accent but that's why like if, not that you'd do it but if you did Latin speaking it'd be so easy because you could just yeah you don't need to put an accent on no. whatsoever you just do it you just say the words yeah so we'd process in you know we'd have these like books and we're like we like walk oh, in like singing. reading did we walk in singing we walked in singing and to be honest like that's actually, actually quite that's difficult that's really hard it's doing yeah. multitasking people are looking at you when when you pass your were, friends they were four part harmonies as well yeah like this was not easy this was like professional singing and if you like side-eyed one of your friends when you're walking in it was so hard to hold it together <laughs> it was like we, i actually couldn't we cope. looked ridiculous we like, did uh, you know like the lay people which were our friends not in a choir not partaking in the mass they were just there watching like they'd look at us like what the actual fuck is going on <laughs> <laughs> some people like weren't even catholic and they were like why am i Literally, here we had like people like we had muslim they were, people they were forced to come yeah these poor muslims they were like literally sat in church like what the hell they had no on? choice and we also had house mm. mass once a week as oh, well God, in your boarding house so you had so to go to mass, mass two times a week two times a week but then there was like prayers like we did morning and evening prayer yeah. every day and we had to sing in that as well we sung in the evening mm. prayer yeah yeah anyway good times but it's salve regina on a sunday night Oh, I love a bit of Salve I Regina. I enjoyed that, you know. Yeah. It would tie up Sunday quite nicely and then just boom out the Salve Regina. Yeah. I actually know that off by heart. Yeah. I mean, it's not really common useful in adult life, but... No. <laughs> yeah. Could but be a party trick. We'd have these, like, functions as well where, like, you'd get, like, house punch, which was, like, basically, like, a summer party for your boarding house, house Christmas dinner... And honestly, like, it would just be scenes because it whether you were overage or scenes. underage, you were trying to swipe as much alcohol as you could. They, like, they served alcohol. We even had a pub. We had a pub. We had a pub on site. For the kids. Like, yeah. a private pub for the children. With a disco ball, you know. Yeah. And we used to put on, like, this terrible, like, fucking drum and bass. Like, well, I didn't, but, like... I'm still partial to a bit of drum and bass. I think that it was part of that growing up experience is put that in your head. Mm. But yeah. Yeah, so when you were 16, 17, you could have two pints on a Saturday night. And when you were 17, 18, you could have three. And Um, all of this worked because, yeah, the drinking age in the UK is 18 years old. Yeah. But there is a loophole that if you are with your parents... And eating a meal, you can have a little drink with that meal from 16 years old onwards. How did this work legally? The school, because of the contract our parents signed, were our parents legally whilst we were there. And they had a a system where we didn't hand over money to buy these drinks. We had like a preloaded card from our parents. Like an oyster card or a travel card. Like a travel card, yeah. You'd swipe it and there'd be money on it. Mm. And to be able to get a drink, you'd have to buy a meal. 
So. And you had to use your own card. There's no way around it. So if had your face on, if yeah. fretfully your parents haven't put any money on it, and you go to get a pint, like, there's fucked. nothing you can do. Yeah. So yeah, the meal was either a chicken and cheese wrap, which is actually pretty banging, mm. cost a bit more though, or just some chicken nuggets. So I remember one time, like me and my friends, we all got some chicken nuggets, had our drinks. We're like, well, we're not eating it because we want to get more drunk. So. We just kind of like left the plates on the side. Someone else decided to make a mountain of chicken nuggets. And there's just like a picture of my friend like falling over and then the mountain of chicken nuggets in the background. But it's just like... Yeah, what we used to do was like iconic. not eat all day. And then some people in my year would also take paracetamol beforehand. Yeah. Then or, have what's it called? Alka-Seltzer. You know, um, aspirin. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. On the hard Caffeine trip. tablets. Yeah, anything that they like word on the street said would get you drunker. Plus like necky three pints. So yeah, at 17 years old, you'd be coming back a little bit squiggly, wouldn't you? And that's that's you completely following the rules. Some people... Did not follow the rules and would like... Have, have a little pre-drink beforehand. Vodka was... and stuff. So then, that's when the school had breathalysers. So you know when the police stop you to see if you're drink driving, you have to blow in that machine? The school had that. They also had it for smoking. So we'd come back from this pub, this private pub in the school grounds on a Saturday night, and the housemaster or house mistress would be waiting at the door with a breathalyzer and a smoke blow. Like literally like blow. And then they'd like tick off on the register like what the level of alcohol in your breath was. And if you had any smoke from smoking, like trouble straight away. Yeah. Alcohol, I think they'd have to like work out the average. Like everyone should be around... What was the I number? think, I I think, think it was, like it was the legal limit. Yeah, the legal limit. I don't know. But then I'm also like, if you're the ones as our parents giving us drinks... It also depends on you and your body mm. how much is going to show up on that measurement. Yeah. So you could be following the rules but still get a high reading. But anyway, yeah, I remember one time I came back to house and it was like in this year I was having a terrible time. I barely went to this pub. Like I wasn't vibing with the people. I was having a difficult time. And I got breathalyzed first. And it was, I think, like 25, like parts what however the fuck we measure parts it. per million there we go and it was like oh that's a bit high stay here and i was like are you joking like, i've literally just had my two pints like the one time i go out and i'm gonna get put in trouble for doing nothing next person blows after me 80 80 80, 80. She was, she's yeah. like yeah you can go i was like <laughs> see you later like for context 80 is that is horrendously high that, yeah so 80 is really fucking high like yeah if you try to operate a vehicle with 80 in your system, uh, say less, honestly. <laughs> Impending doom, like, you wouldn't want to do it. No, definitely not. Yeah, you'd be in quite a lot of trouble with the police, I think. Anyway, I think we've waffled enough about school. You know, I get criticised all the time by Rommel, because, you know, he's 10 years older than me, so I think he very rarely, spe- like, thinks or speaks about school. Mm. And I bring it up, I'm like, oh, like, my childhood trauma. <laughs> but it wasn't that long ago for us, what, it was like... Five years for me. Seven years ago for mm-hmm. me, which is like, now I feel like comfortably far away from all of that. Yeah. But at the same time, like, it's not a normal school experience. Like, of course, we're going to talk about that. Look how much, like, we've just spoken about now. It's mm-hmm. wild. But anyway, the good Maybe thing not. about the school is it had, like, an exchange programme set up with some schools in Chile. So I finished school, I graduated, and then I took a gap year. And that's how I ended up in Chile. So I went to teach English um, in this school. And, yeah, basically that's how everything started. Um, What do you remember about that time, like, me fucking off to South America? (laughs) just thought this is so random and also like she was working like with really religious people like she had to live with like a like a 50 year old nun or something didn't you they were what's called oblates so like they weren't they weren't like nuns or monks but they they could get married or not i don't know it but it was basically like think think of nuns it was and they had a job and stuff and like they all lived in this house so yeah, it was very random because I never like really, aside from the singing, like partook in any of like the actual like religious stuff at school. Yeah. Like I took part in the basics, which was everything we just described, but there was more. Like you went in for the more, like, you know, you did like the actual like little Bible classes and stuff, didn't you? Oh yeah, Lexio, mm. where you analyse a bit of scripture or something from like the gospel and then you kind of share like what it means to you and what stood out and stuff and you hear other people's thoughts and it's called an echo. And then at the end, we'd just eat loads of snacks. 
Yeah. To be fair, that was a good way of getting extra food at boarding school because that was another thing, like... Well, obviously, not going to say you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, but, like, you if you were hungry, like, tough luck. <laughs> to be fair, I don't know where it would come from. You have to wait till like, the next it's, time. It's toast or a bit of plain pasta. Oh, my God, people used to eat, like, raw pasta because they were, like, peckish. Mm. I used to make up a bowl of pasta and add some Marmite into it, mix it up and eat, eat it. It's <laughs> fucking grim. Marmite pasta. Prison food, prison food, honestly. Or bovril, which is, that's, like, war food. That is war food. It's beef, it's beef marmite, basically. Anyway, so yeah, Amelia had two years of school left and I went off to Chile to do this exchange. Anyway, long story short, kind of the, living that life wasn't for me. So I dipped out, but I didn't want to come home early. I did want to have like my gap year experience. So that's when I met a Chilean and, you know, 19 years old, like first guy that's like paid me attention and thought I was, you know, great or whatever and was seven years older than me. Like, I feel like that in itself is a red flag. Oh, because you were 18? Yeah, I was like just 18 years old. And I'm like, what, what's so interesting about me at your big age? You and know, he was 25. 26, 26 when we met, yeah. Obviously, I lived in Chile for like nearly four years um, because I had a relationship there and I met a lot of other um, British girls who also had Chilean boyfriends and like, yeah, there was just kind of like this recurring theme, I think as well, like it was all like very much intensified. I think this happened to everyone regardless, like relationships breaking down because of the pandemic Mm. because, you know, in a studio apartment in the middle of the city, you could go out twice a week with a police permit and I was actually trying to do my exams for my uni finals and I'm sat next to someone who's screaming at Call of Duty all day and I had like nowhere to go. Oh Jesus, yeah. And then I think like um, a lot of people had problems in the pandemic but anyway, that's how that kind of happened and then I met Rommel. Um, But yeah, um, yeah, I've had positive experiences and like for example when Rommel's friends have come over here and stayed the night in the morning like I don't really have to do anything like they fucking they fucking mop the floors like hoover mop wash like yeah. it's amazing wow. it's like it's like having a little cleaning squad I'm like yeah you guys can come Stay over for drinks more, yeah. I'm like yeah come over for drinks on a Saturday night because I know that on Sunday morning I'm gonna have my house clean for me <laughs> But that I'm might just be them, like a good bunch, but... A win is a win, you know? A win is a win indeed. So yeah, Rommel's mates, you're always welcome here because your cleaning is fucking impeccable. Like the Latina mum, like standards mm. of cleaning, like it's next level. Shouting and whacking over a wooden spoon. No, mate, it's the chola, it's the cholita, the, the flip-flop. Oh, the flip-flop. <laughs> Give it a good flick. <laughs> Literally throw a flip-flop at them if it doesn't, if it's not sparkling. <laughs> but yeah... So, no British guys cleaning your house. Quick um, thought, when you were talking about Call of Duty, that just reminded me that my ex used to play Call of Duty whilst wearing a gas mask. What? Yeah, because, I don't know whoever's familiar with the game, but basically your play zone gets smaller and smaller because there's, like, gas coming and it's not safe, so you're getting into, like, a smaller area and you have to wear a gas mask if you're, like... In the in, game. In the game, if you're in the outer area. He was area. sat there. But it, he would sit there, dead ass, like, he, he had a gas mask. I don't know where he got it from. He had some weird items. He had a sword as well, like a real actual sword, like a weapon. Um, but anyway, yeah, he'd, I'd just walk in and he'd be in his gas so mask. Many, so many red flags ignored there, Amelia. <laughs> yeah, one time he went out to work and I just had a look under his bed and I found a massive sword and I got it out and I was like, okay, and put it back underneath. <laughs> Sat there in a gas mask. God, and I thought my situation was bad before. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, British men. Yeah. <laughs> On that note. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be rude about British men. It's more. I mean, our dad is one. Yeah. It's more that I've picked the wrong ones, isn't it? And I think maybe it's a generational thing as well. Mm. Like, what is going on? Like, dating is harder now. I think like. I don't know, I feel like it's actually harder now that we've got like all social media and stuff and there's all the kind of like pressures to get that aspect of things right. When you're like in the early stages, you mm. need to text enough that it shows you're interested, but not too much that it gives you the ick. You know, like if someone's messaging yeah. me before, like I've, I've replied like a few hours later and they're on it as I'm typing, I'm a bit like, what do you think about like um, a guy just coming up to you in a bar and buying you a drink? Do you accept them? 
I don't know because I, things like that have happened before and they've turned out to be a bit it seems a bit creepy and like it doesn't mm. quite feel safe that's the I thing I think it's you've got yeah. to hit that balance of like I don't know but I think maybe when it's happened to me it's been later on in the night and like maybe I am like visibly drunk and at that point maybe like don't really I wouldn't approach me like leave mm. me with my friends because it can come across a bit like predatory yeah I think that's kind of like the overarching theme like from what I saw when I went to Venezuela yeah, and when I went out like girls did not buy a single drink yeah like I went out with a group of like mixed girls and boys I didn't I literally didn't pay a thing which was like obviously like a big change for me like my whole life like obviously we pay for our own stuff in the UK it's very common to go like half and half and and yeah. pay your bit but no there like I actually offered to pay in that group situation everyone looked almost they're like, like <laughs> they're like what and they looked at Rama like <laughs> you gonna let her do that like are you mad so yeah, yeah that's kind of like looked on very strangely but also like in the club like it was packed it was mad it was a saturday night but it was like just good vibes and obviously like people chat a lot of shit about venezuela because of the situation going on but honestly like i felt safer in that club Mm. there with all these guys around me and how everyone was behaving like absolutely impeccably than in a uk club like uk club fucking terrifies me would not go without a boyfriend or, or a male friend like I don't know if you want to share like what happened to you in the UK when you went out oh well yeah I got spiked um with a needle ended up in hospital paramedics seizures how did that happen awful. someone just come in yeah I don't even know someone just injected me didn't feel it on the dance floor yeah it literally murdered on the dance floor <laughs> I, honestly do you know what was what they injected you with ketamine apparently yeah it's crazy it's just crazy because like that's very easy to overdose especially like being injected of it and you know some people think that'd be fun but i can tell you it's not and like why 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 is this happening in the uk so much like i honestly like i couldn't tell you there's something there's something very wrong there there's something very wrong yeah Yeah. i've also like i've just had like a few issues before in clubs like there was a couple of months ago i was trying to just leave with my friends and this guy literally just like grabbed onto me like this. And I had one friend like holding my you hand didn't, like- You didn't know him? Just no. a random guy? No, I'm leaving the club, just walking with my friend talking. He's grabbed onto me. My friend's trying to pull me, pull my hand. He's pulling back. And I'm in the middle like, what is going on? Like, Who I was are so you? shell-shocked because it was so quick that I didn't do anything at first. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I don't know this person. What the hell is going on? And I'm like pulling away and then they let go, but grab onto my arm. I've got a friend on one side, him on the other. And they're just pulling me. I'm like what is going on like that is mental it was really weird i can't remember how i got got away but would you would you like to go to venezuela and experience like a week or so there like see how things actually are or are you scared no i'd go as long as i go with you yeah i wouldn't go alone but literally i understand why people are scared because i'm going to read you out the uk government travel advice about venezuela i mean i still went but it's like a big like title is like the foreign office advises against travel to all parts of venezuela and then they give this map and it's like advice against all travel and advice against all but essential travel and where i went you see it's like in the big fat red line Mm. and it says do not travel within 80 kilometers of the venezuela colombia border because um drug traffickers and illegal armed groups are active and there's a risk of criminal kidnapping um i actually crossed that border in the car (laughs) but there was loads of police there um i mean under the pretense that yeah they're keeping the place safe but there's a whole secondary business going on there like they were looking for (laughs) anything yeah they were looking for anything to like charge like for you basically for you to have to give them money but i had all my papers correct like i think the issue with me would be you can't you can't i stick yeah, out you stick out you i can't. look foreign i can't speak the language and like properly chaos honestly at least i could speak it and i had like brunette. more or less the accent like they knew i was foreign because they asked for papers straight away and every police station i went past it was like hang on papers get get out of the car like yeah it was just annoying but they Same. like i had everything everything was 
like present and correct so it was fine like I never had to pay anything I probably would be a kidnap risk it's like when we went to Mexico and we drove mm-hmm. through a certain area and I literally had to like duck down and like you yeah. know I, I hid under like a coat or something yeah I hid under a coat because they're just like you're blonde like you are the target for being kidnapped like held hostage for ransom and like we were with a family who were like well off so obviously like you'd be able to see from the car mm. that they're well off you'd see my hair and you'd be like bingo yeah so that was Kind but that scary, was Mexico, and, like, the UK government says, like, yeah, go on holiday to Mexico, no problem. But literally was like, do not go to Venezuela under any circumstances. But, yeah, it was great. Um, you should probably go at some point. I need to dye my hair. I mean... Learn the language. Yeah, that would be a good start, because, like, no one really speaks English. Like, and why would they? Yeah. It's not like Barcelona, where you can get away with it. Yeah. But, yeah, um... Did you know that um, Venezuela's got beef with the UK at the moment? I have heard a few things. What have you heard? I've heard about that they will happily respond with reasonable force if we start sending warships over there. We sent one and they've gone quiet, so mm. I don't know what that's Maybe about. Maybe something's coming, maybe it was a threat. Yeah, but you know it's about like the country next door, Guyana. I mean, it just... It, yeah, it isn't great what's going on, is it? No, but it's... the fighting over something that happened 200 years ago and, like... How do you resolve that? I, of course we're involved, like... Of course, like... Colonialism. Like, don't, don't get us wrong, like, we're not going to sit here and defend, like, the British, like, colonial era no. whatsoever, but at the same time, it was just a little bit awkward at the breakfast table when that news came out and me and Rommel like, oh, <laughs> this might escalate. <laughs> Yikes. <Yeah. laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, we can't really talk about like the state of Venezuela, like the state of the UK at the moment. Like, obviously, the two things don't compare. But you know, me as a foreigner living outside and watching like the cost of living crisis unfold, the Tory government just one shit show to the next. Like, what is it actually like? Give us the reality of a post Brexit Britain. Like, for someone who doesn't know, what was what was it like before, and what's changed? Like, how are things now? Mm, I'd say the main thing is like it's so noticeable that prices went up like all the food that we import in supermarkets price has gone up a lot services cost more petrol like that's insane like it's starting to drop down again but how much is it so it I think before stuff kicked off it was probably about was it like 20 yeah per litre uh it managed to get up to 209 I paid once yeah really yeah i paid 209 once that is a madness yeah and it's been like slowly creeping back down since then over like the course of like you know you can fill in venezuela when we went you could fill your whole tank for five dollars that's insane how much do you pay to fill your tank um now 50 55 but there was a time when i paid 65 and i don't even have a big car no it's a little car it's a little ford fiesta yeah r.i.p Ford Fiestas. Yeah, that's really sad. Why? Why? What? I don't know. They're really popular. Yeah. I don't know why they'd be discontinued. by yeah. that decision. Anyway. <laughs> Confused by Ford, but yeah. Yeah. So, that's not fun. Um, I guess, like, culturally, like, maybe there just seems to be a bit more hatred in the air. And is that a direct result of, like, the living situation, the problems people are facing? Like, they can't even yeah. heat their houses and, you know, it's a very cold country. Or is it that Brexit lifted the lid on stuff that was already there, but people were too... Like, they were kept in check? We just, I guess, we won't know, but, like... Yeah, it is definitely noticeable. Yeah. Life's got expensive. How much... Like, how much do you pay? Like, what's rent like? What's food shops like? Mm, Rent is pretty expensive. Like, I'd say, like, your standard place that isn't that nice and it's just one bedroom pretty small would be where i live like about seven eight hundred and what's the minimum wage in the uk now is Um, it like one thousand two hundred pounds i don't know about it's like per month but per hour i think it's like ten pounds because that's gone up because when i first started working i think minimum wage was like six pounds something Mm. so that's really gone up so yeah just comparing like the cost of rent to like what most people earn like obviously not yeah, on. but when I was a student as well, like you get a student loan, so you get to borrow some money from the government. But as the prices went up, that stayed the same. So mm-hmm. it's just like, well, it's like the rent has gone up, yeah. my groceries have gone up, my petrol's gone up, 
everything has, but I'm not getting any more money. So and people's salaries like not really going up. Like sure, they're increasing the minimum wage to deal with this, but like that's just to meet inflation. It's yeah. not. Yeah. Anyway, some students had to use food banks. So that's actually shameful. We're a first world country. Yeah. And a food bank is basically, um, well, how would you describe a food bank for it's people that don't know? Like a a voluntary place that you can donate food to people who can't afford food which before you know with like homeless people yeah. you know people in really difficult situations and now you have like people who are paying to go to university are going to these places because they just simply don't have enough to live like it's, mm. it's honestly wild and also the uk is you know we pay so much tax like yeah. compared to the rest of the world like where where is that going yeah yeah but anyway good questions good questions we see each other like what two or three times a year so yeah gotta make the most of it gotta make the most of it and have our deep chats but yeah I honestly like people always ask us as well like you know you and Rama why don't you move back to the UK I'm like well one the vibes are shit at the moment for yeah. everything you've just described and two like it is so hard like getting a visa if like if you've got a weak passport like the uk is no laughing matter so we went for four days at christmas yeah and i think we paid almost like 500 pounds in total for this six month visa but like the level of detail we had to provide in this like uh daddy was a sponsor like we had to put up like his pay slips my pay slips like like honestly it was just wild like I think for a four day for trip a four day i know you're getting a visa but it's like but like a four day trip at christmas like and and i just like basically waltzed into venezuela like sure i had a letter from someone inviting me um but it was just like the questions I was asked at the border in Venezuela was kind of just like oh, I'm curious oh, how did you two meet like oh not every day we get tourists here like have a nice time yeah it was pretty nice um at the actual border the police was a different matter um but when we got to border force in Manchester when Rommel arrived like we were in the queue for like all other passports mm. and they were literally like shouting at people who weren't understanding like it was not nice and I was like let me do the talking um it was like how long are you here for it, like x days what are you here for christmas and i obviously like showed my british passport spoke to them and we were like through within two three questions done and they were like fully interviewing other people like shouting at them if they didn't understand like it was just not yeah it was just not nice um i've seen that before i, I saw a girl being like interrogated because she had I like, was with you. She had yeah. two passports, right? But she was like, but I've only travelled on my British one, so why do I need to show my other one? They were like, we want to see it anyway. Yeah, so she was a dual national, and she was born abroad, but she'd lived in Britain her whole life, and she showed a British passport. And he was, like, asking her to show the other passport, mm. and, like, she was like, I've lived here my whole life, like, I'm British, like, what are you on about? And we were behind her, coming in on Irish passports, because we also have Irish passports, even though we were born in the UK. I don't know, that, that was fine. Like, yeah. no worries about us being dual citizens, but because she was Eastern European and British, like, she had loads of questions, didn't she? Yeah. It was not nice. It didn't was... they? I swear they lost to, like, look in her bag as well. Yeah, she, they had to open I don't know, it was just very weird, that yeah. whole situation. But, yeah, lots of cases like that. And, like, you could tell that she was literally baffled. Like, it wasn't like... I was baffled watching it. It wasn't like she was felt like maybe she brought in something she shouldn't and looked guilty no it she was just, just was so confused it was like, just thought it was a joke he looked at her british passport and saw like place of birth and it was somewhere outside of the uk and just like went off on one mm. yeah anyway east midlands airport sort it out like we weren't impressed by that no we were not but yeah shout out to our mum for getting her shit together after brexit and getting us irish passports honestly mm. i feel i'm gonna feel like such a fraud when we go to ireland in september yeah, um, we're going. We're going to Dublin, and we're obviously going to go on our Irish passports. On our Irish passports, and I live here because of my Irish passport, EU citizen, etc. But like, I'm going to feel so embarrassed, like going when like, I open my mouth and with it's a just British accent, English, like and handing an Irish passport. I'd be pissed off if I was Irish. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, "Fuck, fuck I'm it. here for the vibes." Another one of like, Don't worry, I love Guinness. I can chop one for you if you want. No, we're absolute plastic paddies. But anyway, thank you to my. I'd like to thank my mum. Thanks, Grandma, for my being actual, Irish. My actual, like, Irish Grandma. Thank you for being Irish, and thank you to the Department for Foreign Affairs in Ireland for giving us these passports. Thank you for accepting us. Thank you very much, because it has made my dreams come true. I can live in Spain. I was able to give Rommel papers. I was able to have this job. Like, 
just honestly like Irish passport coming through doing bits so no passport stamps for us no exactly get through the Barcelona airport queue way quicker and free of charge <laughs> what do you mean do you have to oh yeah because you have to pay now yeah. don't you if you use up too many stamps or something or it's like £10 a stamp or something I don't know no what it is something is weird. that the is it called Etias they're introducing like it's only seven euros or something but it's kind of like the Esther to go to the US Mm. so it's not a lot but yeah if you use up all if you travel a lot and you use up all your pages of stamps you need a new passport yeah so yeah. and it depends like some you might have a part like a stamp on every page and someone might refuse to put another stamp on it you just don't know how yeah so you need to get a new one you yeah. can also buy passports with more pages like more expensive mm. ones but yeah crazy would you because you obviously have your irish passport you know you have a lot of doors open to you do you think you'll stay in the uk forever it's a tricky one like I don't know like I'd love to like live abroad but I think like I do need to learn the language I don't want to be one of those British people that lives abroad but they don't really know what's going on because mm. I feel like it's also kind of like res- I guess like not respect but like to where you're going to kind of know about the culture know the language it's just very helpful yeah i 100 percent agree with that when before i moved to barcelona i learned catalan mm. not that i fucking used like all i used it today was to read the menu and that was it but like when i've helpful. tried tried to speak it like i'm just yeah shut out like they, they don't really want anything to do with me to be honest i can understand it like it's so overrun with tourists here like and foreign people like understand trying to protect the culture etc but at the same time it's like you know i've actually made an effort Mm. whilst most people don't yeah and it's not very well received either i wouldn't want to be one of those people that hasn't made the effort yeah yeah i think it's important um but yeah anyway plans for 2024 okay plans well i'm going chilly very soon i'm so excited going back first time in two years i would like to go to ibiza for the first time ever <laughs> it's nice it's, it's very yeah. close to barcelona it's a 40 minute flight so i would love to do that we're going for a big family reunion jewel birthday party thing in jersey yeah Rommel needs another fucking visa for that so yeah i need to get on that's that. a hurdle but that'll be good we it's a hurdle we will overcome like, we will be there <laughs> I'm going to go to some festivals, you know, the vibes are going to be good. It's going to be um, hopefully good weather, good music. Like, honestly, cannot wait. Just need a bit of sun. I think we just need, like... I need some vitamin D, just... Yeah, I think we just need some good vibes. In yeah, we, we really do. I mean, we could be on the point of another, like, financial crash, but... Or a war. Or a war. You know, whatever takes your fancy. Oh, gosh, yeah, what a time to be alive. Yeah. Maybe another trip here in summer that would be good yeah be a bit hot but god it is so hot have a few beach days yeah well anyway any final words for the people before we wrap up um because we waffled for like two i hours. apologize for my terrible spanish i realized that i said that there was a table and chair in my pencil case and there was not um so try again lo siento mm-hmm. muchas gracias besos it was such like reina behavior hasta luego yeah well thank you if you got this far thank you very much for listening or watching to us i really hope you enjoyed this let us know in the comments if you're watching on youtube or if you're listening on audio you can also leave a review anyway coming back stronger than ever we're starting over we're gonna have more guests we're gonna have me talking alone there's lots in store but for now thank you so much and i hope you enjoyed meeting my sister La Arena. <laughs> Bye. Bye.